Hello everyone and welcome to this Kids Matter Early Childhood webinar, The Little Helps the Big, the benefits of supporting the little transitions in a young child's life. We're really sorry for the delay, we just wanted to make absolute sure that you would all hear us and see us the best way that you possibly could. So we'll I guarantee that we won't lose any time and we won't run over time either. So get on with today's session and get started. I'd really like to thank you for attending today. My name's Amelia Joyce and I'm a Kids Matter Project Officer with Kids Matter Early Childhood. For those of you who aren't aware of much about the initiative, we're funded by the Department of Health and Beyond Blue and we work in partnership with Early Childhood Australia, Beyond Blue and the Australian Psychological Society. Shortly you'll be joined by two of my favourite Kids Matter Early Childhood facilitators, Sandy Clark and Linda Grummer. They'll both be guiding us through our reflections about building protective factors for mental health and wellbeing into big and little transitions that young children experience on a daily basis. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands we are all meeting on today. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. They hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hope of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now I've popped two questions up on the on the screen for you to have a look at. These are things that I'd actually like you to consider to commit to reconciliation throughout today's event. And they can actually be transferred into personal or organisational reconciliation action plans. It's also about taking care of each other in today's webinar. So as we learn and reflect about early childhood wellbeing and education, I'd like you to be mindful when you're interacting and engaging about our unity and respectful of our diversity and also remember that any topics might trigger memories, feelings and thoughts, even difficult ones. So make sure that you, you are aware of what comes up for you and also talk to someone if difficult feelings do occur. There's more information will just pop up on an announcement now for you from the website and that's where you can actually find the link to different, different things about taking care of yourself. There's lots of opportunities to be social in using the chat and polling functions today. We've got lots of chat questions that we'd like to encourage you to respond to throughout the session. But if you're not a fan of chat, you can simply get rid of the chat box by clicking on a little triangle on the inside border of the chat box. That will make it disappear completely. Or you can adjust the size by hovering the mouse over that same border. So before Without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Glenda and Sandy. Hi Glenda and Sandy, how are you going? Hi Amelia. Hi Sandy. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a little poll to start off with, just to, um, just to see where everyone is from today and what educational settings you're connected with. So I'm popping that up on the screen now and hopefully we'll get Sandy talking with us shortly. So remember this is a multiple choice multiple choice um, poll that we can do because I'm, I'm sure you're all like me but if you think about your your life as a whole you've probably come across many of these different different settings and you're connected with them in various ways. How about you Glenda, what are you most connected with? Uh, I've got a bit of a spattering of a few of those, Amelia. Um, kindergarten, preschool, family daycare, mobile childcare and long daycare. So uh, across the board. Excellent, great. I'm just going to stop the poll now and I'm wondering if Sandy you can... And I'm popping that up for everyone to see. And Sandy, uh, can everyone hear you now? Do you want to say hello um, at all? Yes, um, hopefully you can now, Amelia. Yes, okay. we can. That's great. <laughs> great to hear you, Sandy. <laughs> so I'll pop that up. And so we've got lots of people in the other, and I'll just have a quick look over here. We've got people from Department of Education and Training. We've got Family Support Services. So that so we've got lots of people from different areas as well. So. I'm going to hand over to you too. I'll pop back a little bit later to have a chat with you about some of the stuff that's coming up in the chat. But I'll hand over to you both now. See you soon, everyone. Thanks, Amelia. It's great to be here. Because we're all at different stages in our education and care journey, some of this information might be new to many of you, but some it's, uh, it may not be. We'd 
we like to encourage you to reflect on where you're at and with your understanding and to use the chat box to share your story. We'll also, as Amelia said, be taking some um, polls and also asking some questions as we go through the webinar. In regards to our learning goals, you can see them on the screen at the moment. We want to gain an understanding of how transitions impact on children's mental health and wellbeing. We want to look at little transitions in terms of the role they play in a child's life and how they can relate to big transitions. We also want to be able to share some strategies and ideas to support smooth transitions for children, families and educators. We're very aware that, uh, and it was great with the poll to see a variety of education and uh, care settings and schools involved to, uh, today. But we're very aware that for big transitions for children, like transition to school, these processes differ greatly between states and territories. In some states, children are already in school environment for their four-year-old year. But we believe this webinar will be relevant to any educators and parents, regardless of the system that you're operating within. Let's think about transitions. They represent a movement and a change that can play a significant part in the life of a child, adult, school and service. In fact, transitions are happening all around us throughout our lives and signify the end of something and the beginning of something else. In relation to children, when we use the term transition, we generally think in terms of big transitions such as transition to school. But I wonder if you've ever had or can think about a conversation that you might have had with a parent maybe very early on in the year and they've come to you and they chat to you about their child's readiness for school. They might ask you, what are you going to do to prepare my child for school? The parents might have a four-year-old or a five-year-old, but equally they might have a two-year-old or a three-year-old. What do you say to them? Often I think we might talk in terms of the experiences and the activities and maybe even the orientation processes we're providing or planning. We might talk about the benefits of children playing with blocks or Play-Doh. But I wonder how many of us chat with parents about the effects of the building blocks of little transitions that have been accumulated over the life of the child so far. What do you think? From my experience, this doesn't flow off my tongue very easily. So we might ask ourselves, do I know what these little transitions are? Do I know what they look like? Do I know how they've impacted a child and how have they been accumulated over the life of the child so far? I think being able to put a language to these building blocks might assist us both in our work with children and with parents. Much is written and shared about the impact on children and their preparation for big transitions like primary school. But what we now understand is that all the transitions, no matter how big or little, have the potential to impact a child by either providing a protective factor or a risk factor to their mental health and wellbeing. So what do we mean by these little transitions? What do they look like? We will be exploring these as we go along through the session today, but they can include getting in and out of the car to come into the service, arrival time, moving from inside to outside, moving onto the mat for story time or maybe departure time as well. What we'd like to unpack with you today is how these little transitions these little everyday occurrences that the child may experience on a regular basis, how they can be used to provide a protective factor for their mental health and wellbeing. Just before we go on, I'd just like to provide, if I can find this. There we go. Um, thinking about what we mean by mental health and wellbeing, because we are going to talk a lot about either risk factors or protective factors for children's mental health and wellbeing. So we want to think about what we mean by mental health and wellbeing. Keeping children happy and healthy involves looking after their mental health as well as their physical health. Mental health is about having a healthy mind and body and it influences how we feel about ourselves, what we do, how we think and how we relate to others. Good mental health helps us to form positive relationships with others, to be able to handle life ups and downs and generally to enjoy life. 
with good mental health, children can feel good about themselves and be more open to trying and learning new things. Good mental health in early childhood lays the foundation for positive mental health and wellbeing now and on into the future. In thinking about mental health and wellbeing and from what you can see on the slide there, we're really talking about three main areas. We're considering children's social and emotional skill development and their sense of self. We know from research that the child builds a picture of who they are by the interactions that they have with others. What's mirrored back to them either is a risk factor or a protective factor for their mental health and wellbeing. If all transitions represent a change, we know that change can be difficult for young a young child who is just beginning to gain an understanding of what the world is like around them. Children rely on parents and educators to buffer them from the stresses that are normal part of the transition process. But for many parents and also for us as educators, we are also experience our own stresses, both big and little transitions. Maybe we've moved house. Maybe there's been the arrival of a baby. Going back to work. Maybe parents sending their last child off to an early childhood service. Can also be a transition and a stress for parents. Parents may be preoccupied with their own feelings and thoughts. And this uncertainty is easily transferred to the young child who is now experiencing a lack of predictability and stability within their home. Children certainly let us know through their behaviours what they're thinking and feeling and they're asking us as their educators to understand, acknowledge and interpret by providing a safe, secure and predictable space in which to explore their world. If we think about one of the parenting programs such as the Circle of Security, and highlights that children use adults as a secure base from which to explore. And then they use the adult as a safe haven to return back to. Certainly having a this secure base and safe haven generates feelings of security and confidence so that children could move away from the adult to explore the environment, have lots of uninterrupted time and space to play in an environment that's set up to allow for their individual needs. But then they can also return back safely to the educator when they need to touch base. And then they go off again and they explore. And I'm sure we see this happening uh, all the time in our services. Both the Early Years Learning Framework and Kids Matter talk about building a sense of belonging, security and feeling included. And this is what we're working towards in our Early Childhood Program. Using the Kids Matter framework, we can see little transitions as being building blocks towards some of the bigger transitions that children will face in the future. Little transitions like being able to handle changes in their environment, move from one place to another when asked to, and allow interruptions in their play. This can only happen when children feel confident, secure and included. And for these, all of these are protective factors for children's mental health and wellbeing. Okay, hi, I'm back again everyone. We're just going to do a little poll about transitions now. And it's looking at what transition how you what helps you with managing transitions in your in your life. So we've put some options up there. And feel free to tick more than one. But we've also got that something else option. So let us know in the chat box what, what things that you do to help support your transitions throughout every day. Glenda and Sandy, what are some things that you do? I think, Amelia, it sometimes depends how I'm feeling. But I certainly know going for a walk helps. Um, maybe sitting down by myself, even just for a, a short period of time. Or maybe if I want to talk to someone, having uh, the opportunity to uh, have a couple with someone. Excellent. What about you, Sandy? Um, yes, a variety of things really, Amelia. Um, and it does, it depends on yeah, the timing during the day. But I'm really conscious, and let's talk at an 
phrase last year talking about the third space, which is that transition time between taking on different roles. And so I'm really conscious now mm. of making sure that like when I'm leaving work, that I do do something before I become, rise in that door and become a, like a family person. Definitely, definitely. I was once told to change my clothes as soon as I got that's home. Good idea. As well. Now, a good idea. Popped, I've popped the the results up in the chat for everyone, and lots of people have. It's been a pretty even spread of what we selected, but routines was the winner. So lots of people think that that to them having a regular routine helps with that. So I'm going to duck off again, and I think we're leaving leaving you with Sandy now to have a bit of a chat about the transitions from the beginning of early childhood. We'll see you soon. Thanks Amelia, once again. Look, let's think first of all about why changes in infancy and early childhood are different from changes in later childhood and as adults. Um, as adults we experience many changes and transitions on a daily basis and we use language and our previous experiences and knowledges to make predictions about what the change will be like such as going to work in the morning, what it means and what our reactions will be. So we can build in strategies to help us adjust and cope. But even then, there are lots of changes that we all find stressful and that we might have difficulty with. In infancy and early childhood, everything is so new, everything is happening for the first time and young children don't have the previous knowledge and experience to draw on. There's a quote on your screen from Pam Linke and I'd certainly like to acknowledge her work that the younger children are, the more new things there are in their lives and the more changes they have to cope with. She also says that the most change occurs in the earliest weeks and months of a child's life. But the first time for anything can be a bit scary and that's happening for young children on a regular basis. Small things like loud noises and being picked up suddenly might be stressful as they haven't happened before. Um, and we hear that Dr. Bruce Perry say that even a nappy change has been shown to cause a stress response because the infant has large people pushing her around and has no language to understand or previous experience to predict what's going to happen. So we need to consider that everyday happenings may be new changes in children's lives and be aware of how these transitions are affecting children, a child's state of well-being. Certainly research tells us that what happens in the early months and years can have a profound and lasting effect on an infant's development. The positive changes, experiences of change in early years sets the foundation for future changes that a child will encounter. And how are we going to assist children cope with the changes that they will come up across, will meet? Well, we can help children by making transitions as positive and as stress-free as possible and by helping children learn to cope with changes. Um, Bruce Perry, Kids Matter, the Early Years Learning Framework all indicate that supporting children to transition well means providing transitions that are nurturing, predictable, repetitive, gradual, attuned to children's developmental stage. I think Robin Dolby sums it up well when she says that the task of the educator is to be physically predictable and emotionally available. In addition, outcome one of the early years learning framework, that children have a strong sense of identity, states that children feel safe, secure and supported and use effective routines to help make predictable transitions smoothly. So we can see the link between providing for and supporting positive transitions is a building block to supporting a child's positive Sense of self, which is a protective factor for children's mental health and well-being. So when we think about the goals of transition, what are we hoping to get out of transitioning? Certainly it's about managing and organising children's feelings as they move from one setting to another or one activity to another. Um, but also using these opportunities for connection and development of relationships positive relationships with children and using schedules and routines to support social and emotional development. We can use kids that are key messages to provide transitions that support a safe, secure and inclusive environment. In our kids that framework we see little transitions within an early childhood service is being built around the idea that relationships are at the heart of those transitions. 
this provides a protective factor for children's mental health and well-being. And we see that children usually cope well with change when you're in the care of adults who are sensitive, responsive and know them well. Astute educators will also use the opportunity to observe, reflect and plan for transition system service and provide positive, secure and inclusive transitions for each child. This is what transition should be about, not, not the procedures and processes such as packing up, moving on from one experience or activity to another or moving from outside to inside. We're really about providing opportunities for educators to engage with children and assist little transitions as building blocks for all future big transitions. We've got four photos here which illustrate some of the chief matter messages from what we call the four components or the four focus areas of kids matter in relation to transitions. So just looking at the first one about the idea that children need to feel a sense of belonging and feel confident and included by educators and peers. Moving on to the next one about children. I guess really children are different and react to change differently. So an educator who's got a positive relationship with a child and knows the child well can help at transition time by knowing really what helps each child best, definitely giving children some control over changes and transitions makes it easier for them to cope and will depend on a developmental stage but could be about letting children choose whichever activities they'd like to do. Third one, we see that partnerships between parents and early childhood educators are important in supporting transitions. Here we see an educator and parent working together to manage the goodbyes in the morning and some genuine acknowledgement and sharing of knowledge between the two. And lastly, children let us know how they're feeling through their behaviour and reactions to routines and transitions. And some children may need more individual support with their transitions. I'm going to hand back to Glenda now to look at children's responses to transitions. Hello. I think Linda will be joining us shortly. So okay, good. We'll Hello, I'm back. <laughs> You're sorry. back? Okay. Yeah, we'll see sorry you everyone. All right. <laughs> um, children's responses to transitions can be really quite interesting. And what we've done is put this just into the slide to look at a couple of um, categories, I guess, or this spectrum that we've got, um, continuum of children responding to transitions. And the first one is around Children who like to keep it the same, and you might work with children that you could describe like this. They they generally like to um, have the same food on their plate. They like the same person sitting next to them. If there's a slight change in the daily routine, they get upset. They thrive on order and predictability to feel safe and secure. They need lots of time and support to be comfortable. Um, and we often might hear them saying no a lot to uh, when they're offered a new experience or a new activity. And it can, uh, it can either be what we would consider to be minor transitions in our mind, but they actually are major ones for the children. Then we've got children who like to take change in their stride. You know, those sort of children who just come in and even as babies, we know that they, they respond well and they coo and they like changes. They don't seem to worry too much about um, having uh, a variety of people look after them. They even don't mind, you know, things like um, different clothes and different food. But then we have what we term as in the middle. And generally what we think is that most children sit somewhere in this middle. They kind of can move to one side of the spectrum to the other side of the spectrum. And the, it's really important for us to understand particularly where we see changes in children, to understand that this is such a normal part of their development, that we can't actually anticipate for some children how they're going to respond to every, um, every situation. What we want to do is show you a video, and, and throughout the session we've got snippets of video which are available on our website and also in our resource list that when you uh, see this after the webinar. But we want to see how one child, that, 
of um, coped with his arrival into the service. So we'll just pop that video up shortly, everyone. Excellent. So we've just asked people in the in the chat box what what it is that they've noticed, and we've had a few people respond already. We've got people saying that the educator is showing interest and staying staying at the level of the child for a while, being greeted in a friendly manner, and crouching down to his level and taking taking that genuine interest. But what what were things that stood out for you, Glenda? Um. I think it's, it seems very calm, doesn't it, the approach of the educator, like Zach and his father as well. So there seems to be a good rapport between them all, but it just seems to be that he just knows what to do and this is part of the normal day for him, so he's used to it. Yes, and, and someone's also just mentioned in the chat around he had a familiar item from home with those UNO cards. So I think we should, we should probably move on move on to the next section now. And I think, are we being joined by, no, we're still with you for a little bit, Glenda, to talk a little bit more about arrival time. I'll see you all yes. soon, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for that, Amelia. Coming into a service can actually be really daunting for some children, regardless of their age. And not all children will respond like that. So it's not always a smooth transition. And we understand that for um, being an experience for a lot of children. When we think about what's going on for the child, I really like the metaphor that Glenn Cooper from Circle of Security, when he looks at the start of the child's day and the transition into a service, he says, the child steps out of his parents' rowboat into the rowboat of the educator. The problem for the child is that there is a moment where they have one foot in each boat and if the boat drifts apart, they get stuck. Or when the child comes in, and they are not quite sure whether they are in the school boat or in the parents' boat, then they're stuck. So I guess what we want for children is to know that parents and educators are in charge and that they are going to take care of this. The child can need what they need, feel what they feel and still be okay. They don't have to act like they're okay when they're not and they don't have to feel more than they feel and they don't have to take charge themselves. So we've got adults and um, we've got parents and educators working, working together and in sync with each other. What we'd like is for children to experience a seamless transition where the child goes from feeling secure with the parents to feeling secure with the educator. Let's think of some strategies, particularly as I was talking before about both keep it the same children and I'm sure that you've all got um, or can relate to some of those children within your services. Maybe a photo of the building and the educators for the children to look at as they travel to a service. Maybe an activity that the child enjoys doing is set up and maybe better than free play for some children as they come into the service. Maybe the night before having the child choose the activity that they're going to participate in at the start of the next day. Take a photo of it take it home so they can be prepared for that the next day. We need to also respect that some children may need time by themselves when parents are gone, but they actually need a sensitive adult nearby or someone who checks in with them regularly. Maybe it could be a wave or a smile. I know we all get busy in the morning and sometimes when children come in and they're not settled, 
it's easy for us to spend a little bit of time and then we move away, but we need to make sure that we check back and listen. So what might the child be feeling who's finding it difficult to transition? Well, they certainly might be feeling anxious, scared, sad, frustrated or confused. Maybe they're not sure what's expected of them. For some other children, they might be so overwhelmed by the noise, by the environment, by the hurry of what's happening. The physical layout of the environment is certainly a really key uh, element to think about as we watch children come in. You know, we need to think about what's the distance that the child needs to walk from the car park into the foyer and then in the foyer into the room where they hang their bag up. Is that a, a really small space where there is a lot of children congregating so children find it really, really difficult to um, cope? By putting ourselves in the child's shoes, we really gain an understanding of what it is that we can set up for them in a slightly different way. So these may be things that you've reflected on and it's great to see um, some comments coming through the chat. So it's great for us to reflect on these and to really think about what does it feel like for your, the children in your service to come into your service. And I think I'm handing on to Sandy now. So while we wait for Sandy to join us, if you would like to have a quick read over the scenario, that Sandy will be putting up and discussing a little bit. Here she is. Thanks. Thank you. So we're going to move on to transitions during the day. And they can certainly be difficult for children because these transitions involve moving away from something they're engaged in, deciding with what's happening next. It's actually something that we all need to do every day and a skill that we all need to learn. So looking at the scenario, if we look, three-year-old girl is asked by educators to move between activities. She's prone to going up to displays on the wall and tearing them down. Educators often respond by showing their disapproval and asking why she did this and being dismissive and ignoring what they consider to be negative behaviour. Why am I the child be behaving like this. Um, and certainly look forward to hearing your comments too as we go, or seeing your comments as we go through. Um, and really it could be that the time is simply too short and she barely gets into one activity when it's time to pack up again. How frustrating would that be? Maybe that she needs some more warning to anticipate the transition or that she simply doesn't understand what she's being asked to do. Um, Maybe she doesn't like what's going to come next or that she doesn't have the language to explain how she's feeling. With situations like this though, we can see why some transitions are stressful and frustrating for educators and children. These little transitions during a child's day may seem insignificant to us as adults, but they're not to the child and the tweaking of practice can make a huge difference to a child. So how might we look at addressing some of these issues and transitioning between activities. First of all, it's just it's important to keep the relax that relations that we keep relationships to focus and the priority. How can we use these times to develop a relationship with the child, develop their social and emotional skills and support their mental health and well being? Children respond differently to transitions based on their personalities, traits, traits, their past experiences and the environment. Paying particular attention to individual children through observation and what Circle of Security calls being with the child. Sitting with them quietly with the child can provide us with valuable insight. So in planning for transitions, think about the number of transitions that you have in one day. Are they always necessary? Do they allow children enough time to become involved and then finish activities? Or is it just a constant changing and rushing? What's the child learning and attaching meaning to if they're interrupted from their play to transition to snack or lunchtime, go indoors, outdoors packing up, transitioning to rest and meal time? And in particular, think about the number of transitions where all children are doing the same thing at the same time. Do 
do we need to have large group sessions? Does everyone have to wash their hands at the same time? Their children know what's happening, what, what you're going to be doing for the day. Sometimes a visual diary can be helpful to this, pictures to show what's happening through the day or throughout an activity. If a child upset about when her mother will return, you can look at the pictures together of what happens during a day, see what's happening at the moment and what else will be happening when it, before the mother returns. So by doing this together, you're acknowledging that she's upset and helping her to deal with the sadness by making it more predictable and understandable about when her mother will be back. Cues can be used to alert children to transitions. These might uh, include things such as picture cards or a song being played or sung to show that an activity is coming to an end. Remember though, to use these cues with relationship support. Yeah, uh, Dan Siegel talks about connect then redirect. As an example, if a child's using blocks to construct a building and Spend some time noticing and acknowledging what that child has been doing before asking them to move on to the next thing, which shows interest in and respect to the child and helps build that connection. Think about what to do, what's going to happen with the children who transition quickly. Is there something for them to do? Paying something, maybe looking at books or singing songs or rhymes so that not that they're not left sitting waiting. And at the end, remember about positive and specific feedback give to children at the end of the transition. So if we say something like the blocks are all away, Tom has packed them all back onto their shelves, we're telling Tom what he's done and also showing him that he's able to manage that transition as well. And a big thing for me, and I also saw in the chat box, was about remembering that transitions take time and certainly allowing time for them as well. Now Sandy found some some Sandy Sorry. found some photos for us to that we're going to have a look at as well that are examples of different transition times during the day. So do you want to speak with us about that? That Sandy and Glenda might join join you sure. too to have a bit of a chat about it. I'll see you all soon, everyone. Um, sometimes the transitions go well and sometimes they don't go so well. <laughs> but there are all, always opportunities to build relationships. So if we had a brief look at these photos and the transitions happening in the two of kids metal in, um, and like before, it would be good to get your comments as well. Just look at that, that top one. I wonder how long the children have been lined up for and why, or even if that's what, what is going on. Just remembering that routines are in place to support children's needs. Is this meeting the needs of the children? The little girls below, they, they, look as, they, so they know really well what they're doing um, and that there, there looks to be a predictable work routine that they understand as well. They so certainly get a sense of calmness from the teacher and think that there has probably been a good connection or interaction with an educator actually prompting this pack up. And the picture on the right, it's sort of an uh oh moment really, but mistakes can happen and that's okay. When the educators know children well, they'll know whether to actually step in and help this, this, this child or really whether to let her work it out on her own. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make, Brenda? Um, I, I think looking at the top photo is really quite interesting of the little boy, you know, going going like this, um, you know, it's hard to know what the scenario has been, whether he's doing some actions or whether this is actually a frustration for him because he's actually been sitting there for uh, for a very long time. I was thinking about when we line up children, uh, I mean, and we have to have some very good reasons why we do that on that, but thinking about how difficult it is for children to sit around in a circle for some children and face each other, sometimes sitting in a line like that with an educator in front can actually be a little bit less intimidating for some children. So it's actually hard to um, it's hard to know from the scenario, but I think they're great photos. And certainly the little girl on the right who seems to have built some of her her lunch. It'd be really interesting to think about at what point the educator moves into that situation. Is she able to handle it? 
I guess that's part of us knowing or educators knowing children individually, but without without her being too frustrated, do we move in, do we just sit there? Like I was saying, I think with arrival time, some children get a little bit overwhelmed when adults come up to them and uh, and, and greet them. So maybe an a intensive educator that might go in and sit next to, uh, next to the child and just offer that support as a bit of a cue, just sort of sit there and wait and see what um, how the child responds. But I think they're great. They're great photos and great examples of transition. Thanks a lot, Glenda and Sandy. Now we're coming to the end of the day, end of our session. So what a perfect time to be talking about the transition of departing. So we're going to play a little video here for everyone to have a look at and pop, pop what you notice about what supports that to, re to leave at the end of the day in the chat box as you see it. We'll play the video now. What, what really strikes out for me, I don't know about you two, Sandy and Glenda, is that how Zach has given the opportunity to share his experiences of the day with his mum, but also how he gets to almost say goodbye to all the things that he's been doing during the day. So that, that's what really struck out for me. But I'll hand back over to you now to have a bit of a chat about that too. Yeah, I certainly agree with you, Amelia. That's, um, obviously, the mother feels very welcomed um, and really understand some of the routines of the room as well. She knows where to find um, that bag and really what adds that she's quite comfortable going into the room and having a look around and um, it's, it's having a look to see what Zach's been doing. And it's lovely yeah. to see that initial um, greeting too where Zach runs up to her and gives her a hug when he first arrives. Because um, going home transitions are, can be different and certainly Children will um, react differently to them. So some some children may be feeling a bit fragile at the end of the day, and um, may not react like that as well. You got anything you wanted to add, Linda? I think it's a lovely video, isn't it, to see the um, connection between Zach and his mum and the comfortableness with the uh, with the service. I was thinking about the difference between sort of going home and arrival times and. Thinking across our settings, we have children who come for long periods of time and then we have others in kindergartens that might come for a shorter period of time where you've got a child who has taken all of the session to warm up and then it's time to go home. So the response might be quite different. One might be that they're really pleased to see mum, but we also have a know of some other children who find it really difficult when the parent comes because they see that as uh, a real interruption and so we can have some children that might um, do or behave in ways that we might see as not quite so positive, maybe tearing things off the wall um, or they might go and run away and hide. So there's an opportunity there for educators and parents to work together. So whilst we've got that lovely setting of Zach, we know that it's not actually like that for, um, for all children. So it's good to think about are there differences and what's the what's happening for the child and what's the child feeling and thinking in those times of departure and is it different from the arrival time as well. Yeah. So do you, you particularly like some examples that Robin Dolby gives around um, how to set up for the end of day departures, don't you? Yeah, look, I think sometimes children might be anxious about what's going to be said when their parents arrive, so that it might be about what they've been doing and just being able to give children a chance to share with their parents about what has been happening in their day. Certainly, there was a, there's a gorgeous example that Robin Robbie does, does give as an educator who had asked the children in a small group to name one thing that they had really enjoyed in the day and one thing that they'd like to tell the parents. So, just as a, sort of an example 
someone might say, look, he'd love to put his really into his, his story time today, but the one thing that um, he'd love to tell his dad is that he loves them. Okay? So, and that is, she would make, um, you know, actually write those ideas down to, to make it quite um, a process. When the um, parents return, the educator is then around to actually support the children and the parents in reuniting and sharing some of those ideas. So it really helps children organise their feelings and it also gives the parents know what to expect. Um, they know that they'll be met um, and that they also know how to, how to have, it, well, to expect that they will hear from the child about what, what has been happening and what's been important to them during the day as well. So yeah. it's, it's a great way, I think, of actually providing positive and secure transitions for both the children and the families, so that the children are feeling secure mm. and confident and included. Yeah, which leads on really well to the next next little section that Glenda's going to talk about just before we all leave today. And Glenda's got some reflection questions here as well about how we can keep transitions doing what we want them to do, and that's being protective factors for children's mental health and well-being. I'll hand it back over to you now, Glenda. Thanks, Amelia. I think that there's a really fine balance between keeping transitions the same and predictable and having them turn into traditions that start to dictate our planning. And I, and I don't think this is, this is easy and I think it's a really good start of a conversation about how we do it. But I guess one of the things and one of the key messages that we have worked with both the Kids Matter and also the Early Years Learning Framework is that we need to hold in our minds and hearts that relationships come first. So it isn't about making life easier for the adult um, parents or educators within the service, it's about what's going to actually best meet children's needs. We need to understand that planning for transition is about supporting and building the relationship with children. And if we can capture that and remind ourselves why transitions are important for children's sense of well-being, we can start to feel that transitions are important and that they're more important than making life easier for us. Learning to cope with little transitions provides a building block to support big transitions, such as transitioning to school. So when we start planning for our daily experiences and group times or movement around the room, arrival, departure, transition from inside to outside, we really need to be thinking about how will this transition support children's mental health and wellbeing? How will the children feel about being interrupted from their important work to move from something to something else that they really may not be interested in? How hard will it be for the child to sit down with their peers in a line, in a circle, in a large group, in a small group? What will they be telling us through their behaviour when maybe they start sitting or poking the child next to them or touching things? We could go on. But what I want to do is, as Amelia said, leave you with a couple of reflective questions. And one is, what opportunities can you see to further develop relationships during transition time for the children in your service? And the other one goes back to the original one that I spoke to a while ago, uh, was when a parent comes to you and says to you, how are you going to prepare my child for school? Is there something different? Is there a different language? Is there a different way that you could phrase this to help parents really understand that these little transitions build towards the bigger transition, no matter what age it is. So maybe it gives us a chance to do some reflection around that. So we're coming to the end of the day and we've got time now for a few final thoughts and a few little housekeeping things at the at the very end. So Glenda and Sandy, what are your final thoughts about the things that you've explored while in, prepar in preparing for today, but also as we've been going through and a couple of times I think you've had a chance to have a look at the great responses and input that people have been providing through the chat, which has been, been fabulous. I can't wait, right, can't wait to actually sit down and read through them all and go, oh yes, that's so right. Yep. Okay, so what, what, was, what were your final thoughts, I guess? Well, well, I'm interested in reading the comments too, Amelia. Uh, there was one that came through about um, someone's grandson was feeling grass for the first mm -hmm. time and, and I thought what a lovely sensory experience and, and how gorgeous. Uh, I guess in preparing for this, it's really challenged and helped me to rethink the role that little transitions have in a child's life. And so as educators, we can really 
start to change the way that we plan for these within our program. We can see the opportunity and the possibility for really positive connections and interactions that can really impact and make a huge difference to the children's behaviour, their thoughts and their feelings. And we might even see some children's behaviour start to turn around quite dramatically once we start to make these little connections so that we can really support children's mental health and wellbeing by providing protective factors for them. Yep. Thanks, Glenda. How about you, Sandy? And look, I think I'm getting ready for this webinar today. One thing that um, I guess I've changed a bit of my understanding about transitions on was really to value transitions for themselves. Um, as time to be appreciated and as, as time as opportunities for spending time with children and developing those relationships, getting to know children better um, and to use them as time for um, I guess, thinking about their social and emotional development as well. So instead of that, that um, sort of gap between moving from place to place or from activity to activity um, and you know, to treat them with respect and once again to allow the time as well for them. Yeah, I, I think today has really highlighted to me how many transitions that we actually, us and children, have in a, in a single day. I've, I've never really considered it in that sort of perspective before and and also how important those little moments are and that they really do matter in, in the day of a child. And I'll definitely be considering it in the next webinar, which we'll, we have scheduled for April the 14th and it's about top tips for helping young children manage their emotions. So transitions is definitely a time when we really need to be considering how we're helping young children manage their emotions too. So thank you so much today, Glenda and Sandy, for, for guiding our thoughts and our reflections about that. We are about to leave you now and shortly we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye to you all, but we will leave the curtains and the space open for a little bit longer so that you can say goodbye to each other in the chat boxes and also to fill out the evaluation survey. So please remember that it's really important to fill out email addresses and names of people who have attended if you're watching in a group because this ensures that everyone will receive a certificate. So you will receive an email within a week and that will give you a link to the After the Webinar blog and all the resources that are available from today's session. So there will be a, there'll be a recording of today's event, there will be slides from the presentation and there will also be a list of resources and reflective questions that we've discussed today as well and, and a few other little extra bits too. You will also receive your tickets around this time as well but it won't necessarily come both at the same time, but it will be close close together. So we do we, we do urge you to continue the conversation with us and with each other in your staff groups and with your colleagues, even with your families, having a talk about those transitions, the those little things that help make the big ones easier to manage as children get older. But keep connected with us on Facebook and Twitter and via our Shared Thinking blog and all the other little places that we've popped up on the screen now. So we look forward to seeing you next time, everyone, and we'll say goodbye for now. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Ben.